Okay, so um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for waiting. Uh, my name is Murata Atsushi. I'm a director of Information and Culture Center of the Embassy of Japan in Canada. So thank you very much for joining us for to our tonight's sake tasting event in your dinner time. Actually, my daughter just came to ask me to join our the dinner. <laughs> uh, I'm, I joined this event now. <laughs> so sake is a Japanese rice wine and uh, there are various kinds of sake uh, to offer different tastes and flavors to add richness to your meals. Tonight, we will explore a pairing of Canadian dinners and sake, and we believe we can bring you to the new stage of your everyday life with sake. Um, to begin uh, the event, now I would like to invite His Excellency Kamura Yasuhisa, Ambassador of Japan, to say a few words. Ambassador, please. Hi, uh, good evening. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for this virtual sake tasting event. I would like to start by thanking Ms. Mariko Tajiri, Tajiri-san uh, for sake sommelier and educator based in Toronto for presenting this event and sharing her deep knowledge about sake with all of us tonight. Uh, tonight's theme is sake with Canadian dinner. Uh, many people watching tonight are probably enjoying dinner at this time of day. I hope that uh, this event will make you more interested in sake and that you'll make it part of your home as well as your uh, dinner. This great opportunity to discover sake is possible thanks to importers such as That's Life and Ozawa Canada who supported this event. I would also like to extend my gratitude to local distributors in Ottawa such as LCBO, say Japan uh, Suisha, and Arlo Restaurant, who helped supply sake for today's uh, virtual tasting. Um, sake is known in Canada as a traditional Japanese drink, uh, but it can be enjoyed with food beyond Japanese cuisine. With the right pairing and temperature, sake can be a nice addition to meals from anywhere around the world. Last year, uh, Tajiri-san, Ms. Tajiri, visited uh, the embassy to present a workshop on sake pairings with food available in Canadian grocery stores, from vegetables and cheese to beaver tails and uh, putty. This year, I hope that an even broader audience can learn about new and interesting pairings that deserve to be given a try. As our countries continue to fight against the coronavirus pandemic, the restaurants and imported food industries are uh, weakened, influenced. Uh, through events like today, I hope that the Ottawa and Canadian markets gain more interest in sake and Japanese food. Thus, this event will indirectly uh, support such influenced industries. Japan and Canada are part of the global fight against the coronavirus now. And we continue to cooperate at many levels, including trade and economy to overcome the pandemic. I hope that tonight's event will help take your mind off the coronavirus situation and cheer you up for a moment while we go through this situation together. Please enjoy learning more about sake. Have a great evening and bon appetit. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, okay, oh, sorry, we're at the sound. Uh, yes, sorry for disturbing Tajiri-san. So, uh, thank you very much, Ambassador and Kamura. So now, yeah, I would like to introduce Ms. Tajiri Mariko, who is a well-known sake sommelier based in Toronto, and she will give ideas how to enjoy sake with your dinner. So Tajiri-san, please start. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So Ambassador Kamura and Murata-san, um, thank you so much for, for having me. Um, it's, a, it's very much an honor to be here for this um, celebration of the Emperor's birthday. I'm going to start my uh, presentation now so that um, we can take a look together. Oops, let me move this. Okay. Um, 
So today's theme is sake and lasagna. Um, I think that the embassy in Ottawa has, is actually a secret um, think tank for some of the best ideas that I've received over the years. So last year when um, I was able to travel to Ottawa to be there in person, um, I was presented with this idea of pairing sake with um, snacks and, and foods and casual things that we can easily buy in grocery stores. And I was told that beaver tails and poutine uh, were on the table and we supplemented that with some of my favorite snacks like potato chips um, because you know why not um, today because um, we're not able to be together but you are at home uh, maybe having dinner maybe having snacks maybe having drinks or, or water whatever <laughs> you're up to um, I was uh, asked to talk about things that you might be having at dinner time um, and lasagna was one of the things that came up which is a pretty common dinner item I believe um, but you know actually growing up in in uh, Canada um, I came when I was six years old from Japan and ironically I've only had lasagna probably Probably uh, less than five times in my life, so um, it, made me, it forced me to think about lasagna in, in a very different way. But um, what I wanted to talk tonight about, and uh, what the ambassador has already mentioned, is that sake is the national drink of Japan, and it's made by the national bacteria, which if you can believe, Japan actually has a national bacteria, which I'll talk about, and this is koji, kojikin, or the mold that actually allows rice to be fermented into sake, but we believe that it can transcend boundaries and not just be paired with sushi or tempura or anything else you might find, um, but with other things that you find on your dinner table. Um, your dinner tonight might look like this, in which case, um, good for you because that would be very impressive and very lovely. This is not on my dinner table. This is from a very uh, beautiful restaurant in Vancouver called Yua, and this is one of their kaiseki um, starters that we did an event um, a few years back. Um, but most likely your dinner doesn't look like this. Maybe you have spaghetti or lasagna, or if you're like me, um, our household is a mix of cultures. My partner being Korean, we have a lot of um, mixed um, dinners, if you will. So most likely being Canadian, your table is a, a mix of things as well. Um, and I wanted to mention that, you know, things, ingredients and herbs and flavors that uh, were once considered exotic and, you know, maybe you had to go to um, a specialty grocery store are now really easily found at Loblaws or wherever else you find your groceries. I remember my mom, when we first moved to Canada 30 years ago, was very, um, she had to look really hard to find ingredients that uh, she found in Japan. But now it's a much easier, easier time. Um, so whether your dinner is on a couch, is on a bed, or on um, any place, because we are um, at home in a different environment, hopefully you're surrounded by great food and family. Sake is often talked about in the context of traditional Japanese and, um, you know, the, the history that goes along with it. But we want to take it out of that, well, not take it out of that context, actually. But we want to talk about what makes it special and how we can use it or how we can enjoy it in um, our lives now. So often sake is... Um, uh, enjoyed in Japanese restaurants, probably in the context of, of that environment. But there are so many things that make sake extremely versatile and also very special and nothing like we have um, otherwise. So we, ha of course, it's brewed from rice and it was mentioned that um, um, sake can be called rice wine, which I prefer actually, to be completely honest, not to use that term because it's brewed much more like beer than anything, but um, as we'll see in this presentation, uh, sake goes through procedures and fermentations that are very unique to sake. Um, but now, especially in this um, uh, generation, we have sake that can be soft and floral, to creamy, to tart, to funky. We have a huge range of sakes because uh, brewers are now more than ever equipped with the knowledge, with the science and the experience to make sakes that are very, very different from maybe what um, a generation ago was being enjoyed. Also, I want to mention, if you do have any questions, there is a Q&A um, box. There's also a chat box that you can um, um, Yes, that you can uh, 
ask me questions at and I will keep an eye on that. So I'll answer them as we go along. If there's anything that I know we'll cover a little bit later on, I might uh, skip over it, um, but it should be, um, I should be able to, to catch them all. Yeah. Um, some of this information might be very uh, much easy for you or, or repeat for you, but I want to go through some of the ingredients and some of the procedures or the steps in making sake um, and explain why those particular things make sake such a great accompaniment to all sorts of food. Um, the ingredients in sake, we have here rice, koji, water. And all three of these ingredients are definitely needed in making sake. And some of them might seem really obvious to you and maybe others not so much. So rice, of course, um, sake is made with rice. And we'll talk about the distinction between rice uh, that you might have at your dinner table right this minute or with um, sake specific rice. Oh, um, sake specific um, Okay, so sake specific rice is a rice, are there are rice varieties that have been specifically chosen um, by farmers to make sake with, right? And these are, there's over a hundred varieties of rice available in Japan, sake rice that we can use, but actually the top five varieties, and we, we do go over that a little later. You might hear words like Yamada Nishiki or Omachi before, those are rice varieties. And the top five varieties actually make up more than 50% um, of all those sake rice being used. Uh, but we can definitely use table rice um, as uh, our ingredient for making sake. And in fact, the vast majority of sake by volume is made with uh, table rice. Uh, koji, this is the national fungus. I think I said bacteria earlier. Fungus is probably the more appropriate name, um, but it's Aspergillus oryzae. And Japan um, announced a few years back that this is the national fungus um, of Japan, and it's responsible for making sake, of course, but there's other things that um, are also made, like uh, miso, soy sauce, uh, very important ingredients in uh, Japanese cooking. And it's a fungus, uh, Aspergillus oryzae, that is used to create enzymes that allows sugars to be made. And sometimes um, koji and yeast get used interchangeably, and that's actually not correct. So yeast is a very different thing altogether, um, where yeast is used to convert sugars into alcohol, whereas koji is used to make sugars out of starch. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. Water is a huge uh, part of the of the sake making process, and you know when you buy a bottle of sake, actually eighty percent of that is is water. So it's extremely important. Um, and if you've a lot of you, I'm sure, have been to Japan or are from Japan, but uh, there is an abundance of clean water in Japan from deep wells, springs, and the vast network of uh, mountains and rivers and lakes um, that is present in Japan. This is a, a rice field um, in Yamagata Prefecture, and it's one of the producers that I work with um, called Yamagata Masemune, and this is his um, Dewasansan rice that he grows himself. Uh, you know, I've been in, in the sake business for about 14 years now, and over the 14 years, every time I go back to Japan, and hopefully when I get to go back soon again, you hear about different techniques, um, different philosophies, uh, new strains of rice, new strains of yeast that are being used. And so really sake is at an extremely important and very exciting time where we have sake is like the photo you see if anyone's um, close to Quebec or you're, you're watching from Quebec, you know, um, this sake, Terra da Honke, is available, I believe, in the Montreal or Quebec market. And this is a sake that's made with um, uh, pretty much, not brown rice, but it's barely polished. So this is, uh, you can see it's very cloudy. It's very natural and uh, uh, is, is a little funky. So if you have a lot of sake in your life, this might be something that's a bit of a wild card because it's made in this ancestral method and it's um, uh, probably very different from anything you've ever had. Uh, so yeah, it's an extremely important time in sake where we're experimenting. Brewers are um, 
are being allowed more and more. Uh, they're allowing themselves, they're allowing the industry to experiment and, and do new things. So historically, what was sake? Well, it was an offering to the gods, which if you think of wine or beer or uh, many alcohol um, types around the world, this is the case for um, w whether you're in Europe or in Asia. So sake was an offering to the to the gods. Um, and also there's um, uh, a saying that when you're in a state of drunkenness, um, you're able to communicate with, with the gods um, better, right? So, you know, if you're um, drinking at home right now, you're, you're on a uh, spiritual journey, hopefully. And then we come to a time when there was industrial production. So I don't have you know, too much time to talk about the timeline or history of sake, unfortunately. Um, but there was a time, uh, especially right after World War II, where sake was made in um, an industrial method or where we have the effort to try to make more sake with limited resources. Because rice was um, scarce and you know, there wasn't much available, uh, brewers were trying to stretch it. So we have this this era where they were making three times the volume of sake that they usually could have by adding water or alcohol or um, MSG and other flavorings. And so we've come out of that time. Uh, uh, we're very happy to be out of that time, I'm sure. And now we're in a period where we're talking about artisanal brewers, um, craft brewing, if you will, and actually the craft beer industry as well as um, things like uh, producers, for wine who grow their own grapes, for example, the grower champagne in, um, industry. These are all things that the sake industry takes cues from and has learned also from. All right, so now we're in a time where uh, the producers are artisanal, they make a wide range of sake and they can be creative. And actually, uh, last week, I believe I was doing another seminar and someone said, well, why is it now that brewers are experimenting and they're doing new things. What is it about right now? And I think um, the, the, a big answer or a big part of that question, that conversation is that sake brewers were in really hard time. So the brewers were now in their 30s, 40s, 50s. They were coming back to their farm uh, family business when they were struggling. Sake wasn't that popular um, in the you know, 70s, 80s, things like beer and uh, wine and imported whiskey, that was way more popular. So brewers were having, sake brewers were having a hard time and the people who um, were supposed to take over had had to change. They had to say, well, we're gonna do something different because what are we gonna lose? You know, we have to survive and uh, that paid off for many, many producers. And we're now, we're talking about things like terroir, we're talking about creative expression, um, and we get to drink those sakes. Okay. Um, so what's made that possible? Um, brewing is an art, but it's backed up by science. And we live in a time where we can say this temperature or this yeast allows us to make sake like this. You know, what was um, done over many generations through experience and um, one generation teaching the next generation is now backed up with science and by experience and numbers and um, um, yeah, facts. But three things that I've kind of identified that's made sake uh, brewing the way it is now possible. Uh, first of all, rice polishing. So you can see in the photo there on the left, um, those are rice polishing machines. And the uh, accessibility of these machines has made the sakes that we, we make um, really precise. And the evolution of this um, ginjo and daiginjo um, era possible. So it's not to say that this rice machine that you see in the photo, every brewery has, actually most breweries don't have these. So this is um, Hakkai San Brewery, which if you uh, find a Hakkai San Sake at um, the Suisha restaurant or at the LCBO, if you're in Ottawa or you know elsewhere in, in Ontario or Canada, you should definitely drink these sakes because they're a great example of Niigata um, style sakes where they're clean, they're crisp, and they're very refined. Um, but this is, this is their rice polishing facility which again most breweries don't have. This is probably um, a quarter of a million dollar investment, right? But rice polishing machines, um, and I will talk a little more about this part, but um, if you take 
brown rice, your whole grain rice. Um, if you make sake out of that, you're going to get a lot of different uh, flavors. You're going to get some a, a lack of um, um, elegance to the sake. So what these polishing machines do is make it possible for the rice to be cleaned, um, not just clean, but actually but polished down. And there's, if you sharpen your own knives at home, you'll probably use some sort of polishing stone. Um, I cannot because I'm not very good at it. Um, but if you have a polishing stone at home for sharpening your knife, um, these machines have something like that on an industrial scale, of course, and they uh, polish the rice so that we we're left with what we want in order to make the kind of sake that we want. Now, the second thing um, I talk about the middle photo there is a brewery in Akita called Adamasa and a, an amazing, you know, very, very um, uh, uh, famous brewery. It's not in, in Canada, unfortunately, at this point, um, but they um, use uh, cedar barrels that you see here, which is a lost art. You know, it's it's kind of coming back right now, but there's very few um, uh, people who craftsmen who can make these barrels. And last time I heard, there's actually one craftsperson, craftsman who can make these uh, Japanese cedar barrels, the sugi, sugi uh, barrels. Um, but genten kaiki, which you see the Japanese um, characters there for, means back to basics. And you know, using cedar barrels is something, barrels or, or tanks, is something that um, our ancestors would have used a long time ago. So the brewers are saying, well, let's take some of that, some of that uh, knowledge and experience and bring it back. Um, also, this producer, uh, Adamasa, uses a very old strain of yeast that was found at their brewery. And they also use a very old method of um, fermentation. And so even though the science or the technique, not science, or the techniques are traditional and come from a, a different time period um, where our ancestors were, were doing things very differently than they do now, the expression or the actual execution of it is quite different. So maybe we're using cedar barrels, cedar tanks, but the sakes are much more refined and much more elegant, um, but they have this like power and density that um, old techniques give us. Uh, so someone on Facebook is asking, is sake always drunk hot? Definitely not. Um, sake can be drunk hot or warmed or chilled. And I'll talk about some of the um, ways to decipher, you know, how you might want to drink your sakes at which temperatures. Environmental controls, you see, a tank there with um, the white mash, so that's our sake mash, and then in these uh, metal containers is ice. And this might look a little kind of basic to you, but you know, it, it's um, um, having ice at your brewery is actually not very easy and wouldn't have been done, you know, 100 years ago. Ice machines were, weren't available like that. So now we have the ability to um, know that chilling uh, or um, maintaining a certain temperature in our mash is really important to making ginjo styles, for example, these aromatic floral styles of sake. Um, and so we're using these metal holders, uh, temperature controls, but we're also using a modern ice machine in order to make that happen. To polish or not to polish? It's a very um, big question right now in the sake industry. Okay. Um, this picture is of um, not a cross section, I guess, but under a microscope, we have uh, sake rice. And you can see that there is a portion in the, in the rice where it's opaque, where it's a darker um, color. And then the outside looks almost kind of transparent and maybe a little jelly-like. Um, so the middle here, where it's a little darker and it's white and you can't see through it, that is what's called the shinpaku. And shinpaku means um, starch heart. Um, it's the white heart of the of the rice. And this is where all the starch, not all actually, I take that back, it's where the starch is concentrated, right? And we have starch on the outside as well, uh, as well, where it's a little clear, but we also have other nutrients like fats and proteins, nutrients, um, things like that um, on the outside. So uh, when you take a look at this, also don't think that it's like a, it's not like a banana peel where we take off the outside, 
portion and now we're left with just the starch in middle. Um, but when we put these rice, right, rice um, uh, kernels or the rice grains into our rice polishing machine, um, we have now the ability or the techniques and the um, machinery to take off some of the outside layers to get to a cleaner starch source. Right. And what happens to the taste as we polish more of it, as we get rid of more of the fats and proteins and the nutrients, these are the things that that might be good for us or might be good for you know, fermentation, but actually give the sake um, a bigger range of flavors. And what people used to believe was that this was a roughness or a less refined flavor um, that you would get out of the fermentation process. So um, if you've heard of people saying, okay, this rice is polished to 50%, that means that 50% of the rice is left over. 50% um, has been removed. So half of it where the fats and proteins are, are removed in order to have a clean starch source and we make sake out of that. Now, if we don't polish, if we only take off a little bit, like let's say 10% we remove or 20%, so your rice polish ratio is 90% or 80%. That cloudy sake you saw in the photo, which um, uh, apparently is available in Montreal, it, um, that one was polished in 90%. So only 10% was removed. Um, the reason why producers are now thinking about that sort of um, style of sake is that when we keep more of the rice, we keep more flavors or we can create or we can extract more flavors out of the process. And so, you know, this, the rice that we take time to grow is expensive to grow, it's expensive to buy. Why not actually use more of that? So we have more of the sake rice or more of the table rice, more of the rice in the sake itself. Uh, there's a question from Facebook. Is it true they used to chew and spit the rice into a container to let it ferment? Yes, that is correct. That is um, uh, Kuchikami Sake. If you've um, uh, heard about that, read about that, or seen that in some movies, if you, if anyone saw um, Kimi no Na, Your Name, it was a, a, a huge movie uh, animated feature in, I think, 2018. There was a scene when um, the daughter of this um, uh, shrine, she chews rice, spits it into a container, and that is like the, the uh, original form of sake or the offering to God. So because we have enzymes in our palate, in our um, saliva, that allows the rice to break down from starch into sugar and um, natural yeast would take over and would ferment. No one um, does that now to, to the best of my knowledge and you don't try it at home, but um, yeah. That is the origins of sake, which uh, if you look at the history of alcohol, that sort of um, style is evident in many places around the world. So sake rice. This is um, a picture that I took in uh, Hyogo of Yamada Nishiki. Um, and Hyogo Prefecture is still uh, the definitely the, the top place for Yamada Nishiki rice. Uh, this is considered the king of sake rice, and I'll talk about why in a second. But um, uh, sake rice is japonica rice. But we do, when we when you make sushi or when you make rice at home, that is also japonica rice, of course, as well. Um, but sake-specific japonica rice is what we call sake rice. And they've been cultivated over the years um, for different reasons and suitability. And also sake rice, as well as table rice, is grown in rice paddies. So where the, the fields are flooded and drained, usually about twice a year, but uh, sometimes less. And some of the unique features that makes sake rice sake rice um, more suitable and also more expensive is that the grains are larger. Um, so that means that they're easier to work with in the polishing machines. Um, and they also have shimpaku, which I talked about was the starch heart. And when you have larger grains, we can get to the shimpaku, we can work with the shimpaku easier. And the shimpaku, you want it to be well-defined so that you can you can get to that part. Um, other things like the behavior um, of the rice when you're brewing it. So if you've fermented anything um, before, the way that the rice melts or ferments, dissolves, is also a big factor when we're talking about um, sake rice and the price that it commands. Uh, but table rice is 
again, as I said before, most sake by volume is uh, has been made with table rice. And the absence of shinpaku, so the fact that if you look, if you get go into your kitchen and get some rice in your hands, when we're talking about uh, uh, Japanese japonica table rice, you won't see a shinpaku because that's not the nature of table rice. But the fact that it doesn't have it is actually not a problem anymore because brewers have learned how to deal and compensate for this. So, you know, when, when table rice is polished down to 90% or 80 or 50% even, um, we're not talking about the kind of um, uh, ratio of fats and proteins and starches anymore, but because certain polishes will allow you to call it something um, in, classification, that's the kind of the reason behind doing that. But you can also make very elegant sake with table rice. You can also make very full body sake. You can do all sorts of things now. Varieties of sake rice. There are over a hundred varieties of sake rice, as I mentioned before, and every year there's um, new varieties being added. So labs or uh, research centers, uh, prefectures at the university level, they will, um, they are even right now, as we speak, will be researching how to make different rice varieties. And they could be a mix of sake rice as well as table rice. So like the parents could be two different uh, varieties um, and to make maybe a prefectural style or a prefectural variety of sake rice that they want to promote uh, that makes them different. Um, but yeah, top five varieties make up the majority of sake rice being used. The picture on the left here, this is um, in Hyogo and this is um, Ozeki's um, uh, their contract farms. You can see these farmers here. Um, and this is in October when we, they were harvesting. So they, they uh, allowed a group of educators to come in and to um, harvest rice. But it's, you know, a little bit of a show because uh, uh, they certainly don't didn't need us to, to help. And they waited for us to come to, uh, to their farms in mid-October so that they can show us how it used to be done. Um, the, my photo on the, on the right there, that's me pretending to be useful or to look like I'm doing something. Um, but the, uh, the the reality is actually that rice uh, now is not harvested like this. It's it's done in trucks and machines, which are much more efficient than you know we can ever be. Um, but you can see the farmers on on the left here who have been farming all their lives, probably for many generations. And they were showing us how they used to tie the rice that's been um, cultivated um, and hung up like this. This this was done by, I think, some of us. That's why it doesn't look super neat and tidy. But um, doing this is actually a, a lost art as well, because very few people um, remember or still do this. Most people don't. And they were just trying to show us how it used to be done. Yeah. Uh, okay. And you can see that it's really quite muddy and sticky um, in, in the earth there because if you, again, if you remember, we're talking about wet rice patties. Um, that is the, the way that rice is farmed in Japan. Words that will make you sound like a pro. Um, I just listed three rice varieties. There's um, like, well, many, many others. There's uh, over a hundred, as I was saying, but these three are ones that you'll probably hear a lot. Yamada Nishiki, this is the uh, king of sake rice. Right? And the reason why it's called the king of sake rice is because it's the most, um, uh, it, it, Gets the most, the highest price day. First of all, it's the most, one of the most expensive rice varieties, and it's the easiest to work with. We talk about uh, shinpaku, the starch heart. In Yamada Nishiki rice, the shinpaku is shaped in a way that makes it really easy for the polish machines um, to work with, right? Whereas omachi, which is on the bottom there, um, from uh, Okayama Prefecture, usually Okayama uh, omachi has a shinpaku that's harder, is shaped in a way that makes it harder for the rice machines, polish machines to get at. Okay. Um, but Yamada Nishiki is most associated with Hyogo Prefecture. If you see this word um, on your bottle of sake, most likely they're telling you that they're very uh, proud of the fact that they're using this uh, prestigious rice. It's kind of like a, um, a brand of rice, if you will. 
we have the mango glue. This is um, a mouthful, I know, but it's a cool climate rice variety. So compared to Yamada Nishiki, it probably would be harvested um, earlier in the season. Um, Niigata, Toyama is another famous place for this rice variety. And these places, if you know, Niigata gets two meters of rice, uh, sorry, two meters of snow every year, uh, which is which is a lot, even for Ontario. So uh, very cold place. So the rice uh, plants themselves actually don't get very tall, right? So omachi, which can be maybe 160 centimeters, I'm like 165, so pretty tall. Not that I'm tall, but the rice can be very tall, whereas guhaku mangoku rice um, can't get that tall because it's in a cool climate. If you think about, a, um, you know, when you're hiking, the higher up you go, the, the shorter your plants are going to get because it's too cold for it to be really big. Omachi rice is one of my favorite rice varieties, personally. It's an heirloom variety. It's actually one of the parents to Yamada Nishiki. So Omachi and Yamadabo were the two um, heirloom varieties that were combined to make Yamada Nishiki rice. What that means is that um, Omachi rice, um, as an older strain, older variety, has a lot of power, has a lot of energy. And if you um, find a sake with omachi used, which I'll introduce a little later, that is an excellent, um, uh, that probably will be a sake that has a little more richness, a little more power, maybe a little more um, acidity and structure. It's one of the oldest varieties. It was registered in 1866. Yamada Nishiki is uh, less than 100 years old. So these are babies in the, in the world. Question from Facebook, is sake drunk hot? It can be, yeah. I think it's because it's so cold and snowy out maybe that everyone's asking about um, hot sake. It can be, yeah. So a sake made with omachi rice, for example, might be a good uh, option to heat up. That way you get um, a warmer, um, a more full-bodied experience. Where's the sugar? So this is a, a photo of a koji room in, um, in Mie. So this is only some from Jikon, who's a, a very, um, arguably a very famous producer. Uh, his, his bottles are very, very Instagrammable. Um, but if you um, have made wine maybe, or you know how wine is made at least, you know that if you squish grapes or you get grape juice, you've got sugars in there, right? So by adding yeast or maybe with natural yeast, you can make alcohol. Now with sake, no matter how much you cook your rice or how hard you squish it, you're not going to get sugars. So the uh, kind of the misunderstanding maybe is that sake has a lot of sugar. Well, it does have residual sugars, but initially we don't have sugars yet. So we have to, as humans, do something to the rice in order to access the sugars. Um, starches are large links of sugars put together and in order to break those bonds we have to um, first steam the rice but we also have to use koji and this is why koji is considered so important and every single brewer no matter where you go in Japan will tell you that the most important part of sake making the most important process is making koji. So you see in the photo here only sun is is sprinkling koji so this is the, the koji powder, the koji spores, onto the cooked rice, onto the steam rice. And the photo in the middle of the hyphae growing in, so that's actually, I think, penicillin, um, uh, Google said. But you can see the feeding tubes growing in, growing, um, in that photo, and they're looking for uh, nutrients, they're looking for water, and that's how koji, as a, as a mold, um, grows. Right. So they, they need humidity, they need more... Uh, uh, temperature, moisture, same thing, and they need um, heat and moisture. There you go. So koji making is the um, design blueprint of our sake making. So how you make the koji determines what kind of sake you're going to make. Right? So if you make a very strong koji, that means that you're going to have the ability to make a lot of sugars. That means you can also make more alcohol. Um, but it's really a balance of all these um, things that we have to do in order to make the sake that we want to make. Uh, 48 hours is the number of hours it takes to grow koji on average. So these brewers are monitoring uh, their koji gouches uh, for 48 hours at least in these rooms. Uh, sometimes it can be done in more automated facilities or rooms, 
Um, but uh, the vast majority of, of brewers, especially the craft brewers, are using this very time sen uh, time sensitive and time consuming method of making koji. So favorites, uh, koji, koji mo, what does it like or it needs? It needs moisture uh, and a warm, cozy environment. It might not look like it, but this room that um, Onisan is in is um, made out of of wood, a bit of a cedar, and it's also very, uh, not very, I mean, they're controlling the humidity and the warmth. It's probably about 38 um, degrees Celsius, and the humidity in there is, um, depending on, on where he's at, but like at least 60 to 70 percent humidity. And so his role um, is to create a comfortable environment for the koji to grow. So some producers, some producers say that you know, they're, they're the brewers, but actually it's nature. It's koji, it's yeast doing the hard work. And their role is to create the perfect environment for that koji or that yeast to, to do its thing. And uh, for, um, yeah, they're all they are, are people who are facilitating this process. Um, there was a question. These are uh, photos of koji in different various stages. In the middle here, we have um, rice that's been steamed. You can see it's, it doesn't look like rice that you cook at home. Um, and we use the word steam because we're not submerging the rice in water and cooking it. We're actually steaming it. And that's how we get this kind of crispy exterior and soft interior. And that's what we want for the koji to not grow too much, not too fast but at the right speed that we designed it at. Uh, on the left here, oh, sorry, maybe on the right here, we have um, the koji spores. You can see this green powder. The um, shapes, like the, the rice uh, shapes here, that's just the carrier. What we're actually wanting to use is the actual spores, like the powder that's on this. Um, and then here on the left, we see this kind of powdery uh, surface of the rice, and that is the finished result of the koji. So getting it from this rice situation to the finished koji takes 48 hours, give or take. Um, okay, so how should I make sake hot microwave? No, don't microwave it. Um, I'll talk about that too. Someone else asked, asked if you have any sake recommendations in Canada, Ontario, Quebec. Yes, I do. We will talk about that. In a second. So just another close-up of koji. It's um, you can see on the surface the powdery part. That's the koji that has grown. And it's um, when you chew this, it's perfectly safe and very delicious. Uh, if you get to go to a brewery or you come to Toronto and um, taste Izumi's koji, it's very sweet and it almost has like a chestnutty uh, flavor. And these things, these processes that I'm talking about, what makes that um, special or how, what, what, what do we get as a result, right? What is so special about sake that, that these processes give us? And um, first of all, we have a complex fermentation, which we'll, I'll, I have a slide for, but again, wine uh, going from sugar to alcohol is a, is a simple fermentation. And then, but with sake, we have actually a parallel fermentation a parallel fermentation where we have the, um, the starches being converted into sugars and the sugars becoming alcohol in the same tank at the same time. Um, so this is a, something that's quite unique to sake and it gives us complex flavors. The subtleties, we get umami, we get acid. When you talk about very floral sakes that have like licorice and lychee kind of notes, um, then we um, uh, some people say, well, is it infused with light tea or green apple? And, and no, they're, they're not infused. There are infused sakes, but that's not what I'm talking about. We get these flavors out of rice, water, and koji, which is quite magical. So I put magic. Um, no, I meant to say uh, malic. So we have different acids like malic acid, lactic acid, citric acid. These are all um, acid, different acids that we get out of making sake. And as a result, we have um, a huge amount of possibilities now. This is a producer in Kyoto, uh, Matsumoto-san. Um, five, he's got five bottles of sake in the photo and all five of these, each one is made with rice from a particular 
farm from a particular plot, right? So um, they have numbers on them and they're actually addresses of each of the farms. So um, someone also asked, um, how do I know which kind of socket to be drunk hot? Um, I will answer that as well uh, when we start talking about specific sakes. Now, what kind of flavors, aromas will cedar impart on the sake itself? That's a great question. Um, if you um, ferment in cedar, it actually doesn't um, give you any kind of cedar flavor. You do get a little bit of oxidation. So you have like maybe a softer uh, mouthfeel, the same way that barrel fermentation for wine uh, will, will do. Um, but if you age in cedar, then we have actually more um, um, effect of the, the cedar itself. So fermentation in cedar, this shouldn't give you uh, cedar notes or woody notes, but it should give you a different um, kind of trajectory of fermentation. And what kind of sake should I prepare for a barbecue? Probably a bigger salad sake. Um, everyone's, uh, I guess, eating eating dinner, but barbecue probably depends what kind of barbecue. I don't know. I mean, I have um, Korean barbecue probably more than like a southern style barbecue often. So that could be a different kind of sake, but yeah. So up top, we have a simple fermentation of uh, grapes to alcohol using yeast, which we can add or we can use from nature. And that's a simple fermentation. Whereas on the bottom, we have a parallel fermentation that sake goes through. So sake rice, we get starch, but no sugar yet. So we have to use koji. Um, and then we use yeast in, to bake um, alcohol right, and CO2. But yeast is usually added. Um, natural or ambient yeast is, is not common. It's done, but it's not common. So we get to food, finally. Maybe some of you are wondering um, about food pairing concepts. Um, pairing sake with food is not difficult, right? I say that because sometimes people think, OK, I have to go get takeout from a sushi restaurant, or I have to do something special. And this is a presentation or um, a seminar that I did a few years ago. And this is actually sake and the glasses in those, in those glasses is koshu. So it's aged sake as well as um, new sake. And then on the plate, you can see some like prosciutto, some olives, nuts, chocolate. Anyone who's done one of my classes uh, probably has seen this combination of flavors before. But my goal with this is to use um, not composed dishes, but uh, savory, sweet, nutty, uh, spicy, those kinds of flavors to see how they interact with food, uh, with sake. So some really kind of um, maybe obvious or uh, basic uh, concepts are complementary and contrasting. So if you're drinking um, a big, uh, let's say like lasagna, which is our theme, uh, maybe because of the meaty, tomatoey kind of uh, richness that you get in that dish, you use a big red wine, an Italian wine perhaps, to pair with that, that seems pretty pretty normal, right? It's complimentary. Now, when we're talking about sake, um, same thing, if we have big flavors, maybe you want a sake that also has big flavors. So, or you, it's summertime and you have um, prosciutto and melon on your, on your meat plate, maybe you can find a sake that has that kind of melony, fruity note to go together, okay? Um, another concept is contrasting. So maybe we can say, you know, these are opposites, Maybe they'll attract, but maybe they're too far apart or what's missing. So maybe a dish is missing some sweetness or some fruitiness, and we want to uh, make up for that, with, compensate for that with a sweetness, uh, the sweetness in sake. So these are really kind of like simple things that you can do with, uh, with whatever you have in your fridge or your take out. Some of the considerations that I think about when I'm talking about um, pairings are uh, acid and salt are usually positive. So if you have sake with potato chips, which are salty, um, usually a pretty good, uh, pretty good pairing. Acid, an easy way to do it is with lemon. So if you use, uh, if you like oysters, like raw oysters, and you squeeze some lemon on there, that with um, a crisp sake is also going to be a pretty good pairing. Sweet and spicy are quite tricky. So um, I would try it because, you know, actually when you're doing food pairings, uh, failures are sometimes even more educational than successes. A good pairing is, is great, but sometimes um, a bad pairing or maybe not a super successful one can give you a lot of ideas. Um, other things I think about, intensity of flavor and aroma. If you have a really big 
um, uh, like aromatic dish, let's say you're using a lot of spices, you do have to think about how that will, that might fight with some of the sake that you're having, or it might just overpower the sake that you're drinking. Okay. Um, and really the, the big thing here is to taste and experiment. And if you're opening a bottle of sake to do this with, um, it will last forever. So if you open a bottle of a 720 ml um, uh, sake and you have it tonight and then you have it in the fridge and you have it over the next week, yeah, it will be perfectly fine. Now, the lighter intensity sakes will obviously um, change quicker, um, whereas the bigger, bolder sakes will last weeks. I, I often have lots of sakes <laughs> open uh, in my bookshelf and in my uh, fridge, which I'm, I'm sure um, Sean appreciates. Um, but yeah, you want to store it in a cool place if you're not drinking right away. Fridge is great, but maybe you don't have that much fridge space, then you can put it in uh, somewhere cooler. Should be should be okay. Not a hot basement or not on top of uh, your fridge, um, but somewhere cool and uh, dark. More food con uh, pairing concepts to think about, whether um, your sake is a ginjo or non-ginjo. I'm, you know, uh, just going through it pretty quickly, but a ginjo sake it are sakes that are very fruity and floral. They're um, aromatic, so you might get pear, peach, melon, banana, apple. These are all very uh, um, uh, commonly found in sake, but they're ginjo sakes. If you have that kind of sake versus a not floral sake um, or a jimmai versus non-jimmai sake, that's going to give you some uh, direction. A jimmai sake, doesn't have alcohol added. So you, um, a non jimmai sake has alcohol added and it's usually lighter, a little more um, uh, thinner in texture, a little more aromatic as well. Okay. But if you see honjozo sake, those are very light and very um, uh, kind of sessionable, very crushable. You can drink a lot of those. That salad sake, for example, I enjoy a lot with um, acid. So, um, uh, vinegars, uh, lemon, citrus, of course, as well as things like mustard will go really well with honjozo, so added alcohol sakes. Levels of flavor components like acidity, umami, sweetness, um, bitterness as well, all those things are um, things to think about when we're pairing sake with what you're eating. And then next level, if you want to go even deeper and a little nerdier, we can talk about texture, length, finish, complexity, um, texture will change as the temperature goes up or down. So if you're warming socket, it's going to get a little rounder, a little fatter, whereas when it's chilled, it's quite crisp and clean and lean, and that uh, will change, you know, what you do with it, right? So if you're having, again, raw oysters, maybe you want to you, you want to have your sake cold, um, half the bottle cold, and then maybe if you have um, fish and chips, because you could take out from an oyster place, um, then you, or uh, seafood place, then maybe you can warm your sake, make it a little more full-bodied and, and rich. And this is a photo of Eva, who is uh, now the executive chef at Kojin uh, in Toronto at the Shangri-La, but she, uh, we did a dinner together in Vancouver, and um, that's her trying to think through her menu and the pairings. This is a photo on the left of um, what sometimes my dinners look like when I'm um, when I'm lazy, <laughs> but it's a, a very delicious creamy uh, sheep cheese, uh, some charcuterie and olives. And this sake in the photo, uh, there's two bottles, but they're both from Kidoizumi in Chiba. And these are extremely unique sakes in the, the average, the pink bottle there. That one's aged in red wine barrels. And the one on the right, the Kidoizumi, um, is a vintage sake from 2016, just double checking, and it's made in a very um, unique fermentation style. So you get a lot of um, kind of richness and mouthfeel, and it's quite funky. You um, you get a lot of um, umami, but also acidity, and that paired with cheese and like bigger flavors are going to be really interesting. So don't be afraid to experiment with it. You can see I'm. In this photo, I'm using wine glasses, which I do often. You can also use ochoko. You can use, you know, all sorts of things, right? But you can um, heat it up with a hot water bath, or maybe you have a socket warmer contraption at home. Um, maybe you don't. 
but you can use a pot of warm water very, very easily. I wouldn't microwave it myself. It's really hard to control what a microwave, how a microwave is going to heat your, your liquid. So uh, I don't recommend it, but if you like, if you must, <laughs> then, then go for it. Um, you can uh, chill it to different temperatures. You can also um, splash it around. So something that um, isn't talked about very often is um, uh, decanting. Right? And this is really quite fun where if you have wine decanter at home or you just have some sort of um, vessel, you can pour some of your sake, maybe half a bottle into it, splash it around and see how it changes. So how do you know which vessel to use? What are the differences? Um, if you use an ochoko, so if you use a sake cup, like a ceramic one versus a glass one, like a cup as well, that's uh, two different things. But ochoko is in these small sake vessels that you see kind of um, most closely associated with sake. They are around because there's a, there's a culture, I'm sure many of you know, of pouring for each other when you're um, drinking sake. So you know, if you're if now, once we're able to eat in restaurants again, or you're doing this at home with your family, you can pour each other's sake because you don't want that cup to be empty. And these small cups allow for lots of engagement and, um, and drinking. So that's really the kind of the history behind it. And all throughout Japan, we have different ceramics, different art forms, different you know, types of glazes. Um, and now we have um, like artists using glass or all sorts of or wood, different things that we can use for it. Um, but when you use ochoko or smaller cups, they're great for um, enjoyment and dining. It's a little hard to, to swirl, right? If you're using a wine glass, you can do that thing where you swirl it and you um, suck air in through your mouth and you, you taste it. Um, so a lot of the sakes now that are available um, in, um, in Canada are extremely um, uh, personality driven. They have a lot of character and it really does it justice to use not just a wine glass, but a bigger glass so that you can really um, enjoy and put your nose in it and things like that, right? Uh, so war, um, wine, you, the other thing you can do is just take two vessels, right? You take a wine glass and a choco, pour the same sake into both and see which one you like. Maybe you like one tonight and you like the other one tomorrow night. It's really up to you. Um, but as a general rule, the ginjo sakes and the dai ginjo sakes, whether it's jimai ginjo or jimai dai ginjo, those ones are probably going to be better in like a chilled um, kind of vessel. So a wine glass or maybe a glass, um, glass of choco, but a, a vessel that usually kind of closes in like this so that you can um, get the aromatics in the glass. And then Jimmai style sakes or more thicker, more rustic, more flavorful sakes, you might want to use a bigger glass or something that's more open. Yeah. Um, so yeah, decanting is underrated. Serving temperatures, as sake gets warmer, the, uh, the flavors mellow, they soften, they also open up. Now, which styles we want to use? Um, again, this is a generalization. Ginjos, daiginjos, if you see that, that word ginjo in, uh, on a bottle of sake, on a label, or on a menu, then those are the ones, gen um, gener generally speaking, you want to keep chilled. Because ginjo sakes are fruity, they're aromatic, they are really elegant. So if you warm them, you're going to lose a lot of that. So uh, the best um, kind of, uh, yeah, the big, I would say keep those chilled. Okay? The ones that are jimmais, uh, honjozo, kimoto, yamahai, um, those ones you can warm up. And what temperature? It, it depends on the sake. I know that I've been saying that a lot, but it really does depend on the sake. Um, warm could be like 40, 45 degrees. If you hopefully you have a thermometer at home, or maybe you just taste it and see what you like. But at the end of the day, if you like it to be 65 degrees, um, great. If it's too hot for you, then take it back a little bit. But I would not, again, recommend using a microwave or making it too, too hot because then you kind of, you know, you um, uh, shake up the sake a little too much. Uh, a quick note about temperatures is that sake is often heat pasteurized for the most part at 65 degrees Celsius. So that means that that's the temperature where sakes become, um, become pasteurized, right? And a little more um, kind of safe for transport and less volatile. Which means that if you warm a sake over 65 degrees Celsius, you're pasteurizing it again, 
which you know, if you're in Montreal and you get to have MPAS or IHTs, great. Um, sometimes, you know, like if you're in other parts of the country, it's hard to find MPAS or IHTs. And what's so great about MPAS or IHTs is how flavorful it is. So don't heat it too much. I wouldn't go over 65 too often, um, but really you should try to experiment. And Nudokan is, Nudoli means like tepid, it's like warm. So Nudokan is a, is a temperature where it's just slightly over um, body temperature, so maybe like 40 degrees. And you can do that with gym my sakes. You can um, um, yeah, do that with home jewels as well. But yeah, it's just like barely warm, just to kind of warm me up a little bit, but not too much. Adding flavors, this might sound a little crazy to you, but uh, there's a lot of sake um, brewers as well as like sake sommeliers in Japan doing some really fun things by adding um, elements like uh, black pepper, sancho, cinnamon to their sake. So you might want to use a sake that is also a little kind of funkier or bigger and richer so that it can handle spices like black pepper um, or sancho, but you can um, do that and see, see where you get. Uh, sparkling water, beer, bitters, these are all really fun to add to your sake. Um, we found some Italian um, white bitters that's uh, in these little bottles and adding that to some sake um, is uh, really fun. If you have a if you have sparkling water at home or you have, you know, um, what is that called? Uh, yeah, sparkling water maker at home, then you can add that beer to adding that to a cloudy nigori sake is, is quite fun as well. Some don'ts, I'm saying uh, don't decide on the pairing based on where that sake is from, on the specific rice or on the grade of sake. Just because it's a ginjo or jimmai doesn't mean that that's going to pair with A or B, right? So you really have to try things and often I'll, I'll make pairings up in my head um, for a dinner and then when I try it I go, ooh, that didn't work. Um, but maybe again that um, less successful experience will guide me to something else. Aging sake is a really good question that someone asked on Facebook. Um, and yes, you can age some sakes, um, but for the most part, the vast majority of sakes are not meant to be um, aged. So you want to, if you're going to try aging sake, you want to pick ones that are designed to be aged, which uh, we don't have too much time to go into details, but email me or, or message me or on Instagram and we can talk about that. Some ideas to get you started, hopefully, um, because we were talking about lasagna, I want to talk about that. Um, of course, there's different types of lasagnas, right? Whether it's sushi or lasagna, we have these dishes from all over the world, or even just in Italy or just in um, Japan, you have different versions of it. But here, we're, I'm taking a very kind of standard um, lasagna. We have uh, tomato sauce, we have bechamel, we have cheese usually, um, but these are pretty big intense flavors, especially the acidity in tomatoes with the cheese is, is pretty um, uh, intense. So here I would choose a sake that is also as intense, if not more intense, and choose maybe a big earthier jimmai or yamahai sake, which are made with um, natural lactic fermentation or uh, you can do an aged sake. So you want to think about intensity here and um, the, the, the power that the dish has. In the middle we have, um, this is a paella I made with um, a friend from the Canary Islands. She was showing us over Zoom how to, how to cook, uh, how to make paella, which maybe some of you are doing at home more because of COVID. But here we have seafood. I use shrimp, my mussels and octopus too, I think. Um, in there we have sauteed vegetables and we use a fish broth. So what do we pair with that? Um, what came to mind was maybe a crisp, clean, uh, more aromatic sake. Uh, I'm thinking like instead of a crisp floral white wine from Spain or from Italy, somewhere kind of Mediterranean, I'm going to use a sake that's kind of, that kind of has those elements. Also because you've got um, big flavors if you're using bigger if you're using saffron or you using chorizo which apparently isn't um, very authentic my friend said but if you're using some of those things maybe a kimoto or yamahai sake will be um, a good pairing. Unagi and sancho um, I thought maybe a, cre a creamy sorry not nigiri nigori a creamy cloudy sake 
um, would be really nice. Maybe you can add a splash of sparkling water to that, or maybe some beer to um, kind of thin that out, and you're going to have a very refreshing drink with your unagi at home. So sake will keep in the fridge or in a cool place for, for many, many days. And the great thing about sake is that you're not going to have an undrinkable kind of vinegary result, right? You're going to have something that maybe is a little different, has a little less freshness perhaps, but you can keep on drinking it for many days. So you, um, you please experiment with it. They evolve to different forms and different expressions, and you can really um, uh, play around with that. So maybe some people are already drinking, hopefully. Um, uh, we, I've kind of listed here four sakes that um, are available in Ontario and specifically in Ottawa, actually. So um, I start with the left hand one, the Numuro Sugi Tokubetsu Junmai is a sake from Nara Prefecture, a very, very old producer, um, but the current um, generation is, is a young guy um, who is really changing the way that sake is made in his, in his town. Um, very aromatic, crisp, clean, but a lot of great kind of um, structure to it. And this is available at restaurant Arlo, which if you haven't been and you're in Ottawa, you definitely should. And I just saw that they're reopening next week. And they focus on uh, natural wine um, and some sake as well and beer and things. Tamano Hikari Jinmai Dai Genjo, this is available at the El Cibigo. Uh, pretty easily. So uh, you can buy it in 300 mils. You can also buy it in 720 mil bottles. So, so really um, great to, to have that. This is from uh, Kyoto and it's Jinmai Dai Ginjo and it's made with omachi rice. That's the rice I said was an heirloom rice variety, which is really interesting because you've got this like texture and richness of this rice, but the elegance of a Dai Ginjo. Um, really delicious to drink on its own, or you can um, pair it with um, uh, lots of dishes. The Tozai Snow Maiden is a creamy, is a, a nigori sake, and this is, uh, oh, I believe, Kyoto as well. Um, you can get it at the LCBO, and you know, maybe this is the one that you add a little splash of sparkling water, or maybe a little bit of beer, and you make a little um, shandy style thing out of it. This with like spicy food, maybe like a Thai, Thai aromatic dinner would be really nice. And then of course we um, have to talk about Izumi. This is uh, Ontario's only sake producer. It's in Toronto, but their sake is available at, at the LCBO. If you're in Toronto, you can come pick up some um, different kind of batches and um, styles at the brewery in the distillery district as well. This is Genshu, so it's quite big, quite flavorful and um, really juicy. And it's a only pasteurized one, so you get a lot of that flavor of the rice and the fermentation in there. Now, if you, again, um, uh, because this is the embassy's presentation, if you're in Ottawa, um, the LCBO, if you click now deliver to store, um, you can choose where your sake, uh, where you want to pick it up, right? So a really great feature now that you can uh, get these sakes sent to the store of your choice wherever you are in Ontario. Uh, not all of it is available to every single store, um, but if you're, for example, at Rideau and King Ed in Ottawa, they'll deliver many uh, bottles there, and they also have a great selection. Restaurant Arlo, they have a couple sakes, um, the Niwino Sugi and the Nida Honke, which is an uh, uh, organic producer who make um, very traditional styles, but a uh, modern expression of it. Uh, they have two bottles. You can find them, uh, find the bottles on their website. And Sejapan, Suisha, um, they have uh, food for takeout. They also do uh, have sake for takeout and delivery. So uh, please check them out and you please support your local restaurants because they could certainly use your support. Yeah, uh, so these are just some places. I'm sure there are different places in Ottawa or beyond that have selections of sake. Um, but yeah, hopefully that will start you on your journey to drink more sake. Uh, thank you. Oh yeah, if you need, if you would like to uh, reach out to me, this is my uh, favorite photo of myself with um, a sake amphora um, from Nida Honke. Uh, there's sake in there, believe it or not. They imported this from Europe, but it's for sake. So my Instagram accounts are up there. Uh, Hakko Gakko is my sake school and my email address is there if you want to ask about 
sake aging or anything uh, sake related, please don't hesitate. Um, and thank you. So thank you to the embassy for having me and I'll uh, bring it back to Murata-san, I think now. Thank you, Tajiri-san. So it's a great presentation, sir. Um, you make me very thirsty and hungry now. So I think I have to rush to uh, my family to join dinner <laughs> with sake tonight. And uh, so, and uh, also, I hope um, the all viewers uh, th thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, I also hope all of you are uh, checking the the LCBO website and uh, restaurant Aro and Suisha to uh, order the sake uh, for your dinner. And so thank you very much. And uh, I now I'm like to wrap up the, finish up the event. So thank you for joining and have a pleasant evening. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay,